So this video lecture will be about um, aid and, and donors. And um, first thing we're going to have to figure out is what aid actually is. Now, as I've discussed previously, we have this sort of uh, capitalist economy. And in capitalism, capital, money, moves to different places. Aid goes to the places where capital, money, resources doesn't go. So rural Botswana doesn't, uh, in the capitalist system, no one invests. There is no money in rural Botswana. So that's where aid comes in and is able to fill that gap that uh, exists in the capitalist economic system. So that's what aid is or, or how it functions. It gets money to the places that don't have money. Now, how is it done is a, is a little bit different. Often aid, and if you watch the um, debate that is, is posted for this course, you'll see Hernando de Soto argues that aid is more or less the left wing of Western national governments. And the right wing of uh, Western national governments is the one that's trying to do business, uh, setting trade policies, uh, extracting resources, as we'll see later when looking at Canada. While the left wing of your Western national government is the one that's doing aid projects in the developing world to be able to sort of solve these, uh, these issues, connect with people who sort of lost out when it came to, to capitalism. Now, what else you'll see in aid is that uh, there's a high degree of fragmentation. So there's many, many different agencies who are trying to do aid, and they're also trying to do aid in many, many different sectors. So it doesn't focus resources in a particular way, and that will be sort of explained a little bit later. Uh, there's another idea connected to aid more broadly. It's something called the... It's connected with uh, economics. It's an economic theory first, and then you can sort of um, transfer this idea to the aid industry. It's called the law of diminishing returns. So what that means is um, normally it's cheaper to produce this table that I'm sitting at. It's cheaper to produce it the more tables that you produce because you know how to do it. You can buy your um, raw materials in bulk, for example, and then you'll get a lower price per square meter. But when it comes to the law of diminishing returns, eventually that cost will increase because you'll be overburdened with um, administrative tasks, for example. So because there are that huge number of aid agencies, maybe at some point it sort of met that law of diminishing returns idea, and now it's becoming more costly than it should be doing. Should be. Uh, now I'm going to get into, we're going to talk about four different types of uh, aid. Multilateral, uh, bilateral, INGO aid, as well as humanitarian aid, which is um, humanitarian aid usually fits under those first three somehow, but it's a different type of aid than uh, what we're going to be talking about first. So those first three groups, bi bilateral, multilateral, and INGO aid, they're doing aid that sort of will encourage economic growth or uh, encourage education or health sectors in a particular country. So multilateral aid, uh, there are a few, there are many institutions that do it. I'll just name a few for you. There's the World Bank Group, the African Development Bank, the International Monetary Fund. There's also an Islamic Development Bank as well as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Now, I'm just going to run through a few strengths and weaknesses of each of these types of aid. Um, multilateral aid is uh, relatively immune to lobby forces in that there are many different players involved in those uh, international organizations, and they have to find some sort of level of consensus. Now. The counter-argument to that would be one nation often plays a lead role 
in these international organizations. So even though there are many countries involved, and we'll see later when we look at the World Bank and the IMF, there are 188 countries, but the U.S. has 16% of the uh, vote in each of those uh, institutions, more or less 16.5. So they still play a lead role in that organization, even though it is an international organization with 188 countries. Uh, you also have these political problems when it comes to dealing with countries dealing and trying to work together. Uh, in the IMF, for example, they are trying to do voting reform, and it's been happening for about three years now, and they haven't been able to find a, a solution yet to voting reform yet in the IMF. Um, like in the World Bank and the IMF, they've developed a particular ideology, somewhat connected with neoliberalism and those ideas of the Washington Consensus. And aid then is then tied to that particular ideology. So America was able to push these ideas of the Washington Consensus and the IMF, gain support in the IMF, and now aid from the IMF is tied to that particular ideology. When the organization is such a large scale, you'll see a lack of flexibility. So in these uh, international bodies, it's very difficult for them to be flexible, to adapt to, to the changing nature of development work. And you can see that a lot in the World Bank in that um, they're still doing these large um, hydro dam projects, for example, that probably there are better solutions when it comes to uh, energy in the developing world. But these are sort of the ideas that they've been working with. They're not particularly flexible in working with new ideas, so they'll still sort of push these ideas of huge hydro dams, when maybe that's not the best, the best way for the developing world. Um, what you'll also see in these multilateral agencies is that they are quite popular, uh, able to pay a sufficient salary or a higher salary than, than an INGO could probably pay. So you attract specialists uh, to those organizations. So you really see this sort of uh, congregation of, of specialists within these, these international bodies. And, but you also see diversity, because I mean, you'll, there'll be many countries involved in this international organization. So you have many different opinions, ways to deal with particular issues. Issues often then become political if countries are, are dealing or negotiating with each other. You can imagine that politics will then enter it. So you have this idea of politics, but then you also have this idea of consensus. And consensus is often, uh, the way it plays out is that it gets to the lowest common denominator. So it's not the best solution based on various opinions, it's the lowest common denominator that everyone can be happy with. So you can also see that in multilateral organizations. But in other cases, if you uh, read the example about the road project in Brazil, for example, a paper is posted on this uh, course's webpage, you'll see that one person can sort of gain control of a project. So here it was Skillings, the country chief, who was able to, country chief of Brazil, so he's able to gain control of this road building project and really push it forward, even if his team didn't really agree with that. So here you'll have an individual, because there's a hierarchy in these, these organizations, and, and they're able to, if you're higher in the hierarchy, you're able to make uh, these decisions then that one individual will have more resources than through different types of aid and is able to do more work. And that can either be good or bad. When it came out to, to the uh, road project, it turned out to be quite, quite negative. So that's sort of a brief synopsis of uh, multilateral aid. Now I'll move on to bilateral aid. So bilateral aid, this is the aid coming, going from one country, so the U.S., to the developing world. So there's USAID, UK Department for International Development. Uh, most interestingly, China uh, is becoming a bigger and bigger bilateral aid uh, player. And it was only uh, last week that they uh, made a 60 billion uh, American dollar package uh, for Africa, which I'll discuss in a bit. So 
When it comes to bilateral aid, the United Nations set a goal about 45 years ago uh, that it should be 0.7% of your gross national income. That's how much you should um, invest in, in foreign aid. So five countries have done that consistently over that time period. Sweden, Norway, Luxembourg, Denmark, and the Netherlands. And the UK passed a law this year that they're also going to do the same thing. Now, when it comes to bilateral aid, there are many countries. Even within countries, there can be more than one agency or more than one ministry. So there could be like a development ministry, but there could also be the foreign affairs ministry that's also doing development work. So you have high degree of fragmentation. There are lots and lots of different agencies, countries involved in this process. Now, because of that high degree of fragmentation, there are sort of two things involved here. It's less bureaucratic, but less bureaucratic from the donor side. So that money doesn't need to go through an international organization and then to the developing world. It can go straight from the donor country to the developing world. However, when it comes to the recipient, and this isn't just about bilateral aid, but it's also about um, INGO aid and even a little bit uh, when it comes to multilateral aid. If you're a country, if you're uh, Lima, Peru, for example, and you're collecting, uh, you're receiving foreign aid, and you're receiving it from all these different countries. Now, your local bureaucracy, your administration, will be overburdened with dealing with sort of technical issues related to the people coming in to do the development work. So people need to process those visas, renew those visas every year, uh, dealing with other sort of legal practicalities when it comes to the state. So when you have this high degree of fragmentation, you have many different countries working in a particular um, donor recipient country, then a lot of the resources of the country that could be spent on education or health is spent on processing visas for development workers coming from abroad. So that's called um, capacity stripping. Uh, you're, you're taking resources away from the uh, developing country so that it is able to deal with people coming in ready to do development work. Um, also, in multilateral aid, the agencies can sort of have this degree of specialization. So the IMF has a specialization in sort of economic development, so let's say. And there's the WHO that specializes in health. When it comes to bilateral aid, you see less specialization. So you'll, you won't have countries doing exactly what they're best at doing, but they'll do a variety of things. And that often has to do with the politics uh, in the donor country. So they need to be able to say, the government needs to be able to say, we're working on this field, this field, this field, and this field in the developing world. But even if they're not a, an expert in that particular field, they'll just work in that field anyhow for sort of domestic political reasons. Um, you'll also see that as they need to work in these different fields, then they'll sometimes give very small amounts of money to that particular field. So the numbers could be in the thousands or in the tens of thousands. And normally that's just not enough money to deal with that one issue. But you'll see that a lot just so they can say, yes, we do deal with this particular, particular issue. But those costs involved in the administration and moving the money, usually by the end, then you're investing or you're donating into this foreign aid idea, but in the end that money isn't really getting anywhere because it's tied up in administrative salary costs before it gets to the developing world. So with that fragmentation, both in uh, agencies as well as sectors, in the end you'll end up with relatively small amounts of money and that money can't be used in an efficient way. Now I just wanted to read some uh, quotes about this latest China situation. So China has uh, promised a 60 billion package to Africa. Um, of course, 
like aid projects, uh, one of the major reason, reasons for wanting to do this is so that African people are able to grow and prosper. And once they grow and prosper, there'll be a new market for Chinese uh, goods to go. And that's what has happened uh, with aid in the, in the Western world and in North America as well. That by doing aid projects, the idea was that eventually those people would be able to consume the manufactured goods and uh, then goods from the developed world could enter into those those countries. So you're seeing the same thing when it comes to China's relationship with Africa. But China is also just sort of focusing on infrastructure, something that uh, Western world doesn't do as much as it used to, say, in the 1970s. And I'll just read you some quotes um, about the situation uh, that the political leader said. China strongly believes that Africa belongs to the African people and that African affairs should be handled by the African people. So here, China is speaking indirectly about the Western world. In the developing world, you have this, uh, you often come across these ideas that aid money dictates to the developing world how they should function and what they should do and where they should spend their money. So it's tied aid and tied aid to that ideology. And China here is playing on that and saying, we're giving you this money, but we're not going to tell you what to do with it. And another quote from the situation was, we should remain committed to political equality and mutual trust. We should respect each other's choice of development paths and not impose our will on the other. And again, you see that same idea, they're speaking indirectly to the Western world and how the Western world has dealt with aid in that they're telling African countries what to do with that aid money. And China is trying to play against that and saying, we're just giving you the money uh, in improving your infrastructure, which is what you want here in Africa. And then through that, then we can both grow and prosper. So you're seeing this really interesting political game happening uh, when it comes to bilateral aid at the moment. Now I'm going to carry on to uh, NGO aid. So NGO aid, it has this idea that it's closer to the poor. So it's people, it's people working at this uh, poor, really close to the poor, uh, in rural areas, one-to-one -one projects. Normally you'll see the person working there with you. They'll live and, live and work in your community. Um, the idea is that it's not tied to mainstream political beliefs. As you'll see later when I talk about Canada and their development work, though, it's not necessarily the case and it doesn't always work out like that. Uh, when it comes to NGO aid, what you really need to think about, though, is what it's doing. Now, is it uh, replacing services that the government should be doing?